Hello, my name is Andy Wilson. I work for Yorkshire Cancer Research and I'm here to tell you a story. It's called Berin Blum and the Bowery Bombs and I hope you enjoy it. I'm going to tell you the story of the discovery of chemotherapy and I'm going to tell you the real and full story. So I am nothing if not good value. Um, if you were to meet a person in the street who said, oh, I know the story of chemotherapy, I will tell it to you. Uh, and I realise that's a, a, an unlikely event that you'll meet that person. But anyway, if you did, I can guarantee you that they would only tell you half the story, but they would think that that was the full story. So I'm going to tell you the entire story this morning. Um, and it's also the story of a Leeds-based cancer researcher called Isaac Berenblum, who was funded by Yorkshire Cancer Research back in the 1920s and 1930s in Leeds. There he is. Our story begins in Italy. And we begin in Bari. So Bari is a, a coastal port city in the southeast of Italy. Um, and if you were to go there today, I think you would enjoy it. It's got a, um, an old town called Bari Vecchio, which has lots of narrow alleyways which lead into shaded piazzas. And in the middle of Bari Vecchio, there is a larger square which has this beautiful white cathedral in it. And this is the Basilica of St. Nicholas. And this houses um, some of the uh, relics of um, St. Nicholas. And this has been a place of pilgrimage for Catholics from since about the mid 1200s uh, and still attracts Catholic pilgrims to this day. There is also a small harbour stroke marina, which has been very nicely done up. Uh, and on the other side, just around the corner from that photograph, there is a much bigger industrial port, which is very important to our story. Uh, and which you're going to hear about a lot more about later on. Um, Bari's got a reputation for being a kind of sleepy kind of city. The pace of life is very relaxed. It's got some, it's got what's um, thought to be some of the most beautiful coastline in Italy. Uh, and yeah, a lovely place to visit. But that was not the case back in 1943. So in July 1943, we get Operation Husky, which was the Allied invasion of the island of Sicily. And Operation Husky was the first step in the liberation of the mainland of Italy. Now, to understand this fully, we need to go back a little bit further. So in October 1942, we get the Battle of El Alamein in Egypt, where Montgomery's Eighth Army defeats Rommel's Italian and German troops. And it was an incredibly important victory for the Allies, and it prompted Winston Churchill's most famous quote of World War II. This is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end, but it is maybe the end of the beginning. As I say, it was a very important victory. It was certainly the beginning of the end of the war in North Africa, or the Desert War, it was also called. Um, by the spring of the following year, the Italian and German troops had completely capitulated, um, and about almost half a million German and Italian troops had been rounded up and imprisoned by the Allies, which left an awful lot of Allied forces in North Africa um, available for redeployment. So a plan was hatched for the invasion of Sicily. Before this happened, there was a very important piece of subterfuge, which has become quite famous because uh, a book's been written about it called Operation Mincemeat, uh, which has now been turned into a film starring Colin Firth, which is really good. It's only just come out recently. I've seen it and it was excellent. I recommend it. Anyway, Operation Mincemeat was led, was it was um, an act of subter subterfuge which led the Germans to believe that the Allies were going to, in fact, uh, attack Greece before they attacked Italy. And it did lead the Germans to moving some troops away from Italy down into Greece, which was exactly what the Allies were hoping would happen. So 150,000 troops were moved in 3,000 boats across the coast of North Africa towards Sicily, and then supported by 4,000 aircraft and 600 tanks, they attacked the southeast coast of Sicily. Uh, despite the fact that some German troops had been moved away, there were still something like 70,000 German and Italian troops defending Sicily, and this was no uh, easy um, operation for the Allies. They lost about 20,000 troops during the war in Sicily, and it's believed that the Germans and Italians lost probably about an equal number of troops. It took six weeks to take the island, but eventually they succeeded. And that then gave them the base to start to prepare to uh, liberate the mainland of Italy. September 1943, that began with Operation Baytown, 
So again, Montgomery's Eighth Army attacked across the straits there onto the very tip of the toe of Italy around a town called Reggio uh, and were successful in landing there. Six days later, we get Operation Avalanche, which were American troops attacking the town of Salerno. They came under very heavy fire there, much heavier than was expected, but they did succeed uh, and made a landing. And on the same day, we get Operation Slapstick. So somebody was having some fun in the war office and Operation Slapstick saw um, British troops uh, attack the town of Taranto, and that was largely undefended and they had a fairly easy ride there. Um, they made very quick progress up the East Coast, and by uh, the end of September 1943, they'd managed to catch, uh, capture the city of Bari. And they knew that Bari would be very important because Bari has this enormous natural and very sheltered harbour. And the Allies knew that this was very important to take the harbour because they could use it to bring in all the armaments and troops and, and all the everything that they needed to um, succeed in this uh, liberation of the Italian mainland, they knew that they could bring in through the port of Bari. So it was very quickly floodlit, and within, within a week or so of the capture, it was being used to bring in um, day and night, ships arriving, being unloaded, uh, and bringing in all these supplies that the Allies needed. So it's hugely important. One of the issues though, however, was that it was largely undefended. So there were some very rudimentary anti-aircraft um, defences around the harbour, but not very much. Um, the Allies, as you can imagine, were very, very stretched at this time, but they also were under the impression that the Luftwaffe was so um, under so much pressure elsewhere in the Mediterranean theatre that they would not be able to muster enough planes to make an attack on Bari Harbour. So it was left largely undefended, and that turned out to be a huge mistake. On the 2nd of December, a lone Luftwaffe pilot flew over Bari Harbour, realised how busy it was and how important it was to the uh, Allied war effort, and also realised that it was basically undefended. As soon as he landed, he filed a report, and during the day, that report moved from desk to desk to desk up the German chain of command, and eventually it landed with General Field Marshal Albert Kesselring, uh, one of Adolf Hitler's most trusted lieutenants. He was in charge of the whole of the Mediterranean uh, theatre of war for, on behalf of the German army. Um, and General Field Marshal Albert Kesselring decided to take immediate action. He ordered an attack on Bari Harbour that very night. And uh, around eight o'clock that evening, over 100 German aircraft attacked the harbour. The attack lasted less than 20 minutes, but it was absolutely devastating. Um, 27 ships were sunk and over 2,000 uh, Allied troops and civilians were killed. And that puts it on the same scale as the much more famous attack on Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. Um, as I say, 27 ships sunk. Now amongst those ships, there were two ammunition ships. And when they were hit, they exploded with a ferocity that um, shattered windows up to eight miles away from Bari, so you can only imagine what it must have been like to be anywhere near those docks when those ships exploded. Now, unbeknownst to anybody, there was also a third ammunition ship in the harbour that night, and it was the SS John Harvey, and the SS John Harvey had an absolutely top secret cargo on board, so secret that even the captain, Elwyn Knowles, was not supposed to know what was on board the ship. The cargo was in fact 2,000 mustard gas bombs. Now, why were these bombs being moved in, in total secrecy to Italy from America? Well, this goes back to basically World War I. Uh, we had, as we're about to see later in the presentation, very widespread use of chemical weapons during World War I. Those chemical weapons were so reviled by all involved that in 1925, the nations of the world came together and signed a treaty banning the use of chemical weapons in warfare. That was very much a step in the right direction. However, unfortunately, that treaty only banned the use of chemical weapons. It did not ban the manufacturing of chemical weapons and it did not ban the stockpiling of chemical weapons. And given that the nations of the world didn't trust each other very much in the aftermath of World War I, most of the nations of the world continued to make and stockpile chemical weapons, as was the case certainly in America. 
These two, so no chemical weapons to this point had been used during World War II. But these 2,000 mustard gas bombs were moved across the Atlantic to Bari because Churchill and the other Allied commanders were worried that because the war was beginning to turn against the Germans, that they would resort to chemical warfare in an attempt to turn the, the course of the tide of the war. And if the Germans did that, the Allies wanted to make sure that they were able to retaliate immediately. So hence this shipment of mustard gas bombs across the Atlantic in total secrecy. Unfortunately, the SS John Harvey was hit during the air raid, went up with another massive explosion, which sent uh, mustard gas vapor out into the air across the harbor, and but also mustard gas um, oil out into the, the harbor water. Just go back a second. So mustard gas is uh, highly volatile. So um, it, uh, as an oil, it's a kind of it has a yellowish color and slightly mustardy kind of smell, which obviously where the name comes from. It's very volatile. It very easily turns into uh, a vapor, and it's hugely poisonous. Um, it attacks the membranes of the eyes, so it can cause temporary or permanent blindness. It attacks the membranes of the throat, uh, the mouth, the lungs. Um, restricts breathing, and it burns the skin really, really badly. It's a, a, an appalling um, chemical to, to be anywhere close to. And as I say, this ship had just exploded and sent 2,000 chemical, uh, 2,000 bombs worth of uh, mustard gas out into the harbour and the air around the harbour. So the attack was about eight o'clock in the evening. Um, by the following morning, the men were already beginning to show blistering of the skin. Obviously, there was a, an operation around the harbour to try to help every, to help people as much as possible. Um, and we see some uh, Italian boys here um, racing to get um, casualties off to the hospital. Now, a really unfortunate thing was that because this cargo was top secret, obviously nobody knew that it was in the harbour. Therefore, nobody knew what was happening? Why, why were these soldiers' skins being so badly blistered? Why were they already starting to show signs of blindness with swollen eyes closing? Nobody knew. They didn't know that it was uh, mustard gas. So what they did was to, um, in order to help these soldiers, was to wrap them in blankets to keep them warm. But they didn't strip them of their uniform first. They just wrapped blankets around the uniform. So these uniforms, saturated in mustard gas oil, were wrapped tightly around um, the, the bodies of these um, soldiers and naval men and it just in fact just made their skin burn even worse so it was an act of kindness which unfortunately um, caused even greater injuries and deaths. That's a photograph of firefighters trying to get control of the situation on the dockside and that's a very poignant photograph of a man uh, rowing his way around the harbour looking for survivors. So absolute devastation in the harbour. The casualties were moved to Bari Hospital, which, as you can imagine, very quickly became overrun. And the medics there had, were just completely baffled by what they were seeing. These people were being moved, the patients were being brought in, going blind, being burned, and, and no reason that the, the, the medics could think of about why, why this was happening. Rumours began to circulate that the Germans had in fact dropped chemical weapons, and this wasn't any rumour that the Allies wanted um, to become more widely known, um, again for fear of chemical weapon, weapon warfare breaking out. So the Americans responded to this growing crisis in Bari by sending this chap, Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Alexander, um, incredibly bright guy. He was a, a doctor and also an expert in chemical warfare. And as soon as he set foot in Bari Hospital, he knew immediately that these uh, patients were suffering from mustard gas injuries. And he instructed the medics in the hospital to immediately begin to treat them for mustard gas. Um, he reported this immediately up the American chain of command and it was denied completely. He was told, no, you're wrong. There, are, there, are no, there was no mustard gas in the harbor. They're not mustard gas patients. But he ignored that because he knew He'd seen mustard gas patients before, he knew what he was seeing, and he continued to order the medics to deal with this crisis as a mustard gas crisis. Um, this problem in Bari went all the way up to Winston Churchill. Basically, there were people within Allied Command who wanted to reveal to the medics at Bari Hospital that they were dealing with mustard gas patients, but 
Um, it went, as I say, went up the chain of command and Winston Churchill said, absolutely not. There is no way we are admitting uh, what was on board the SS John Harvey. So it was still maintained top secret, even though Stuart Alexander continued to file reports saying, this is mustard gas. Why are you telling me that it's not? He's also, just, a, just as I said, he was a very bright guy. He managed by going down to the harbour and mapping where the, um, the sunken vessels were and also by studying um, the, uh, the soldiers and sailors as they came in and studying their various injuries, he managed to pinpoint the fact that it was the SS John Harvey which had had the chemical weapons on board. And again, he filed that report and again, he was completely denied and he was told that it was wrong, but it wasn't. He never worked his mind. What we're interested in, in terms of our story about chemotherapy, is Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Alexander's final report, the final report of the Bowery Mustard casualties, and this particular paragraph. There were two peak points in deaths on the third day and the ninth day. The first peak related to the effects of the burns and the mustard gas. The second peak represents the effects of lung inflammation imposed on patients with low counts of white blood cells. And it's that last sentence that's all important. So what he had discovered was that the mustard gas was killing the white blood cells in the patients who'd been affected by it. And white blood cells are hugely important to the human body. They're a part of our immune system. Uh, they attack invaders and basically they, they keep us safe. Um, but what was happening was that the, the mustard gas was killing the white blood cells. Now, that person in the street who I mentioned a few slides ago who thought that they knew this, the full story of the development of chemotherapy would now tell you that Stuart Alexander's report was seen in America by these two chaps, Alfred Gilman and Lewis Goodman, two researchers based at Yale University, that they saw this report and they had that little spark of um, ingenuity to say, OK, well, if mustard gas can kill white blood cells, perhaps it can also kill cancer cells. And that's the story, that's the story that's widely um, held to be the truth. But it isn't in fact the case. Alfred Gilman and Lewis Goodman were hugely important to this story and I'm gonna come back into it later on. I'm not undermining their part of the story whatsoever. But as we're going to discover, Gilman and Goodman had already been working with mustard gas and cancer patients before this report from Stuart Alexander was filed from Bowery. So Alexander's report was important, but it wasn't the spark that started the fire that became chemotherapy. In fact, it was just more wood on a fire that was actually burning quite brightly, um, even at that point. So to fully understand this story, we need to go back further in time, and we need to go back to World War I, July 1917, in fact. And we need to go back to the trenches around the Belgian uh, town of Ypres. Um, trench warfare, um, very... Uh, established in that area. We had uh, British and Canadian troops facing, acro facing across no man's land towards the Germans. And one foggy night in July 1917, the Germans fired a volley of mustard gas bombs, the first time that they'd been used in warfare. Now, to be absolutely fair, I should say that the Germans were not the first to use chemical weapons in World War I. The French had actually started the use of chemical weapons, but they weren't mustard gas bombs. But in July 1917, we get this first volley of mustard gas bombs. The soldiers awoke to discover a thick yellowish green cloud veiling the sky, and what they reported uh, as being a smell like horseradish pervading the battlefield, and um, certainly an acrid smell. And as I say, this was the, the, this volley of mustard gas bombs that had arrived overnight, and it was a devastating attack. 2,000 men were killed or injured in that, from that one volley of mustard gas bombs. And mustard gas came to be greatly feared during World War I. This is a famous photograph, um, a line of soldiers who've been um, at least temporarily blinded by mustard gas. Some of them will have been permanently blinded by it. Um, and this poor young man here, a young either British or Canadian soldier here, very badly affected. So you can see eyes swollen shut, so at least temporarily blinded, but you can see his skin here burning. There's a huge blister there on his wrist. There's more under his armpit. There's more coming around his neck and under this armpit too, and they're beginning to come on this hand as well. And um, nurses reported that most injuries that soldiers uh, had inflicted upon them during the World War, that they would 
they would be able to tolerate with kind of stoicism and no matter how bad those injuries were, they would lie and quietly, um, you know, suffer, but suffer in silence, showing that British stiff upper lip. But it was different with mustard gas victims. Blinded, burning, having difficulty breathing. Just such an awful situation that they would scream and cry out in their misery. It was just an awful situation to be um, affected by mustard gas. By the end of World War I, it had caused over a million casualties and there had been 90,000 deaths attributed to the use of mustard gas. So let me introduce Edward Bell Crumhar and Helen Dixon Crumhar. They were Americans. They were doctors, in particular, they were pathologists. And they were working um, with the American army in France. And it was their job to, um, as pathologists, to do the autopsies on dead soldiers. So they were working in temporary field hospitals like this one doing these autopsies. And they filed uh, a very important report back to America, which was actually covered in the American Medical Journal. And this, in terms of our story, this is the key sentence. Mustard gas exerts a direct toxic action on bone marrow depleting white blood cells. So much earlier than Alex, Stuart Alexander in Bari, they had discovered that mustard gas was killing white blood cells. As I say, this was reported in the American Medical Journal. This could have been the spark that began the you know, chemotherapy, but unfortunately with the world in turmoil during World War I, it, it was missed. The importance was missed. So nothing happened, but all credit to the Krumhans for, for making this discovery and reporting it back in 1917. Now we move on to another hero of our story, Isaac Berenblum. So just at the end of World War I, 1921, Isaac Berenblum enrolled as a medical student at the University of Leeds, and it had been a very long journey for him. So Isaac Berenblum had been born into a Jewish family in the Russian town of Bialystok in 1903, and that's what it looked like around that time. Bialystok had an unusually high proportion of uh, Jewish population. About 60% of the population was Jewish, but unfortunately, uh, three years later, 1906, there was a pogrom, an uprising against the Jewish population. There were at least 80 deaths, there were at least 80 serious casualties, and many of the Jewish families fled from the town, and the Berenblum family were one of those families who fled. They fled to Belgium, but unfortunately, their, um, their safety didn't last long there because they had to flee again eight years later as the Germans invaded Belgium, and this time they ended up in England. Um, as I say, by 1921, Isaac Berenblum had found himself in Leeds, where he had opted to study medicine, despite having no aptitude or particular liking for the subject. So how would that strange state of affairs occurred? Well, in the late 1970s, Isaac Berenblum wrote an essay about his life, and I'm going to quote a little bit from it because it explains this, uh, this unusual situation that he found himself in. A significant event which almost ruined my future academic career was some well-meaning advice I received when I was still a schoolboy of 15. A friend of the family, an organic chemist by profession, came to visit us and out of politeness asked me what I intended to do when I left school. I told him that I had a passion for chemistry, but was otherwise not very interested in my studies. If only I could be accepted at university despite my poor school record, I would aim at becoming a research chemist, I told him. He asked me how good I was at physics. Pretty poor, I replied. What about maths, he asked. Even worse, I had to admit. He shook his head sadly and told me that to be a good chemist, one's physics had to be good and that in turn required advanced mathematics. His information may have been basically sound, but it was psychologically disastrous for me. I took his implied advice so seriously that I gave up the idea of going into chemistry and eventually enrolled as a medical student, a calling for which I knew in advance I had no aptitude or any particular liking. So Isaac turns up in Leeds and enrolls on a medical course. Fortunately, he wasn't on that course for very long. The various um, study pathways available in Leeds meant that soon a place became available on a course in physiology and biochemistry, and he switched, and that was much more to his liking. And as we'll see later, he had a very eminent 
uh, profession in cancer research. 1925, so Perenblum has been at Leeds for about four years and then uh, a very important uh, meeting took place at the old Queen's Hotel in the middle of Leeds, the, the, the great and the good of Yorkshire, the leading aristocrats, the leading medical men, the leading industrialists gathered for a luncheon meeting at the Queen's Hotel. And out of that meeting came the creation of an organisation with a very grand title, the Yorkshire Council of the British Empire Cancer Campaign. And that was the beginnings of Yorkshire Cancer Research. Now, with that new organisation established and with um, some funds at their fingertips, the first thing they did was to fund a new Department of Experimental Pathology and Cancer Research at the University of Leeds. And the first head of that new department was Professor Richard Passy. And in the 1920s, he wrote, financially, this department owes its being and indeed its entire maintenance to the support which the Yorkshire Council of the British Empire Cancer Campaign has accorded the university. Now, since the 1920s, Leeds has gone on to become one of the leading cancer research centres in the country. So hugely, hugely important work has been done in Leeds and will continue to be done in Leeds. So we are very pleased and um, very proud to have been part of the catalyst of that, the beginnings of that development of that cancer research. And I should say we still fund that research in Leeds very generously. We've funded more than 40 million pounds of research into Leeds since the year 2000 alone. So we get this new department and one of the first people to arrive into this new um, cancer research department in Leeds is Isaac Berenblum. And he is put to work studying skin cancer. Now it doesn't get off to the greatest of starts because talking to one of the one of his older colleagues uh, in, the, in the team, he was told all the worthwhile experiments on the subject have already been done. Um, thankfully, he ignored that comment and got stuck into his studies. What he was tasked with finding out was, do cancers grow more quickly on areas of skin which have a rich blood supply? So he set about trying to find the answer to this question using um, a, a very normal biological pro process called hyperemia which is uh, the process by which the body can increase the blood flow to a particular area of the body if it needs to. So if you were to rub your arm for long enough, your arm would become red. The reason your arm has become red is that your body has increased the blood flow to that area. So by rubbing your arm quite vigorously, you've managed to um, 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 interrupt the blood supply to that particular area, which has led to it becoming deoxygenated. And the body's response is to say, okay, well, we need to get the oxygen level back up in that area. So we're going to flood more blood into that area, open up the capillaries and send more blood to that area, which is why your skin becomes red because there's more blood in the area. This was, even back in the twenties, this was a very well-known biological process. So Isaac Berenblum decided that he was gonna use hyperemia in order to um, begin his experiments. So, his plan was to take a group of mice and split that down into two, two further groups. So one group of mice would have a tar painted on their backs, and that tar was already known to very readily cause cancer. It was a carcinogenic tar. So one half of the mice would have the carcinogenic tar painted onto their backs. The other group of mice would have the carcinogenic tar, but mixed into it a skin irritant. So the skin irritant would irritate the skin, that would increase the blood flow to the area. And then by comparing the results from the two groups of mice, Perenblum would be able to see if the cancer grew more readily in the, um, on the mice, which had the mixture of the skin irritant and the cancer tar. Uh, would, would, did the cancer grow more readily there than in the group of mice that just had the cancer tar? So in his first experiment, his skin irritant um, that he used was something called CO2 snow, but what he quickly discovered was that it was too liquidy and he couldn't get it to stay in place or, uh, in, uh, where he wanted it on the, on the back of the mouse. So that was abandoned and he cast his mind around for what, what another type of skin irritant that he could possibly use. And remember now we're not long after the end of World War I, so um, the chemical warfare during World War I would have been in his mind. And he came he, fell upon the idea of using mustard gas because it had already been proven to be, unfortunately, an incredibly effective skin 
irritant, as again we can see there. So, got hold of some mustard gas, and he made a very dilute mixture of it, just 0.1%, and he added it into his tar mixture. And he painted half the mice with the mustard gas and carcinogenic tar, and half the group with just the carcinogenic tar. He would have been not surprised whatsoever to discover that 100% of the mice who received just the carcinogen carcinogenic tar developed skin cancers. What he was very surprised about, however, was to discover that in the group which had received the skin irritant and the carcinogenic tar, only 8% of the mice developed skin cancers. And again, he realized that there was something about the mustard gas which was inhibiting the cancer. So he had discovered a chemical which could inhibit cancer. Or to put that another way, he had discovered a chemical therapy for cancer. Or to put that another way, he had discovered a chemotherapy. So chemotherapy is just a shortening of chemical therapy. It means the treatment of cancer through the use of chemicals. Now I should say Isaac Berenblum did not coin the phrase chemotherapy. That was coined by the German researcher. But what he had discovered in his own words was a substance, a chemical substance, which could inhibit cancer. And from what I've read about Isaac Romero, I really like him. He comes across as a very modest man. Um, and in his, in his summary of this report that he wrote about this experiment, he apologizes for not having um, discovered what he was initially asked to find out. He hadn't discovered whether cancer grew more quickly in areas with a rich blood supply. But he is really pleased to have discovered what he describes as a relatively rare phenomenon, a chemical which can inhibit cancer. So we have a breakthrough. Story now moves across the Atlantic. A couple of years later, in 1931, two researchers working at the Memorial Hospital in New York, this was one of only two cancer-only hospitals in the whole of the world at the time, a very prestigious place to work. And working there were two researchers, Frank Adair and Halsey Bagg. And they began their own experiments with mice um, and mustard gas and discovered very similar results to Isaac Berenblum. And then they took the big step of treating the first humans with mustard gas mixture. They managed to successfully treat 13 skin cancer patients. And one of their reports said, the tumor has been destroyed gradually. At the present, there is no evidence of the disease and there is good healing over the site of the original tumour. So very promising results. But for some reason, despite this success, they decided that they didn't want to take this research any further. And they concluded their report with the hope that this preliminary report may suggest possibilities to other investigators. Now, why they didn't want to continue with this work, I'm not sure. You would have thought would have been so successful that they would have done, but they didn't. They went up to work on other things. And unfortunately, the potential for chemotherapy stalled again for about another 10 years. And now we move on to 1942, and we go back to Alfred Gilman and Lewis Goodman, who I mentioned earlier in the presentation. And in 1942, they started to look at treating lymphoma with mustard gas. Now, lymphoma is a type of cancer. It's a cancer of our lymphatic system. The lymphatic system is a really important part of the body. Um, it is responsible for um, taking away the waste products that come out of cells. It's responsible for getting rid of excess fluid in the body. And very importantly, it is responsible for transporting white blood cells around the body. And I've said white blood cells, part of our immune system, very, very important um, to keeping us um, safe and safe from harm. So lymphatic system has lots of white blood cells in it circulating around, protecting it. Lymphoma is a cancer which affects one particular type of white blood cell called lymphocyte. And with lymphoma, the lymphocytes grow and divide too quickly. Before the cell gets to maturity, it divides again and again and again and again, all the time before it gets to maturity. So actually these white blood cells that are dividing too quickly are no use for fighting off um, bacteria and other invaders. They don't do anything to help the immune system. All they do is accumulate and accumulate and accumulate by the million and the million and the billion and the trillion. And what they, have, what they do then is basically block up the lymphatic system, in particular the, the nodes, which are an important part of the, the lymphatic system, become, begin to swell just with these useless um, white blood cells inside them. 
So this was the cancer that Gilman and Goodman were investigating. They did one single mouse experiment, which exceeded their expectations, and then they began to look around for a human patient in order to do further experiments. They didn't look for long. They came across a man who has gone down in history known only as JD. Now, JD was a 48 year old Polish bachelor, and he lived in this, and the Americans would call it a city, we would call it a town, the city of Meriden in Connecticut. And Meriden is very similar to Sheffield in terms of its history. So it was famous metalworking center, in particular famous for cutlery, just like Sheffield, also famous for the manufacture of ball bearings. And JD worked in one of these ball bearing factories. In April 1941, he went to his local doctor seeking help for what he thought was a swollen tonsil. He's got a swelling just kind of under his, uh, in his throat there, under his um, jawbone. However, sadly for him, it was very quickly discovered that it wasn't a swollen tonsil at all. It was, in fact, cancer. Um, he had lymphoma um, and he was began treatment. So um, he lived here in the town of Meriden, which is 20 miles north of the city of New Haven. And New Haven is where Yale University is and where Gilman and Goodman were working. And all of JD's treatments took place in the hospital in New Haven, which is associated with the University of Yale. So he had surgery and radiotherapy in New Haven, but unfortunately the disease was too progressed, didn't halt the spread of the cancer, and his outlook was very, very poor indeed. So we can see this is um, a diagram of JD, which was found in his medical notes, and this is the size of the swelling in his neck. It's absolutely huge. So he's having real difficulties swallowing, breathing, talking. Um, and yeah, we get this unfortunate um, entry into his medical report in August 1942. The patient's outlook is utterly hopeless. The end seems near. Gilman and Goodman became aware of JD. They went to see him and they asked him if he wanted to become involved in an experimental new treatment. And with such a grim outlook ahead of him, JD was enthusiastic in his response and said, Yes, absolutely, I will do this. Please proceed as quickly as possible. So on the 27th of August, 1942, JD got his first daily injection of mustard gas and nitrogen. And the response was miraculous. Within a month, this terrible cancer had disappeared. Absolutely fabulous results, surpassed anything that Gilman and Goodman had been hoping for. But unfortunately, that cancer came back. So they treated him again. And again, the cancer disappeared, but it came back again even more quickly this time. So they treated him again, and unfortunately, on the third occasion, the treatment had no effect whatsoever. What was the problem here? Why was this cancer keeping on coming back? Well, what we have here is the, resist, the issue of resistance, which has been one of the bugbears for chemotherapy treatment ever since. And to understand resistance, we need to understand the power of doubling. So I'm going to use this chessboard here to explain this. So we have here a standard chessboard with 64 squares on it. And on the first square, a grain of rice has been placed. And then on the second square, that's been doubled up to two and then doubled up to four, and then doubled up to eight, and then doubled up to 16, and so on. And if we continued to double the number of grains of rice on every square of the board over and over again, so 32, 64, 128, and so on, all the way along every row, how many grains of rice do you think we would need to be able to place on that final square on the board? It's an absolutely staggering amount. The actual number of grains of rice that you would need on square number 64 is 18 quintillion, 446 quadrillion, 744 trillion, 73 billion, 709 million, 551,614. And don't forget the 14. Very important. That is an absolute staggering number of grains of rice. If you want to look at it another way, it is 1.4 trillion tons of rice and if you want to look at that another way that is enough rice to cover the entire surface area of India to a depth of one meter in rice that's how much we'd need to get onto that final square on our chessboard and that is the power of doubling and then let's go back to our chessboard so 
we can very easily turn this chessboard into a cancer example because we have 64 squares on the chessboard. That equates to roughly two months in time. So let's imagine that each square represents one day. Now, on day number one, we have one of the cancer cells which has managed to become resistant to the chemotherapy treatment. And cancer cells are actually quite good at developing this resistance because they're not bothered about checking themselves very well before they divide. Normal healthy cells go through a very rigorous checking process before they divide, but cancer cells don't do it anywhere near as well. They're happy to divide with mistakes in. And because they divide with mistakes in, they are more likely to divide with the potential to resist the treatment. So let's say on day one, we have our first cell, which has managed to, um, the chromosomes have been changed inside and it has managed to develop resistance to the treatment. So on day two, and cancer cells can divide about once every 24 hours. So on day two, our first resistant cell is divided. We now have two resistant cells and then four and then eight and then 16. And by the end of two months, we've got over 18 quintillion resistant cells. So that is the problem of resistance. So JD unfortunately died 96 days after he started his treatment. So it wasn't a life saved, but it was at the very least life prolonged. And what was really important about the JD case was that it really gave momentum to chemotherapy for the first time. And within five months, 60 more patients had received mustard gas treatment at centers across America. The ball was well and truly rolling. And just to put this into historical context, Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Alexander's Bari Harbor report was not written until early the following year. So as I say, Stuart Alexander's report was just more wood on the fire, but it was not the spark that started the development of chemotherapy. Today, about a third of all cancer patients receive chemotherapy. It's incredibly important. It's one of the main workforces of cancer treatment. There are over 100 types of chemotherapy, and it's particularly important for treating blood cancers, which can't be treated with surgery. It can complement surgery and radiotherapy, so we can give chemotherapy before surgery or radiotherapy in order to shrink a tumour, and, and it can also be given after surgery or radiotherapy in order to try to mop up any stray cancer cells that might be left in the body. I'm just going to tell you very briefly about two clinical trials that we're funding in Leeds, so FOXTROT2 and FOXTROT3. So the first FOXTROT trial, which to be fair, not funded by Yorkshire Cancer Research, but an incredibly important trial, which established that the current procedure for bowel cancer at that time, which was to give surgery followed by chemotherapy, Foxtrot 1 showed that that approach was not optimal. And in fact, you could get better results by giving chemotherapy first, then the surgery, and then more chemotherapy. And that has become the standard approach. So Foxtrot 1 was a very influential trial, which has changed standard procedure for the treatment of many bowel cancers. However, Foxtrot 1 wasn't perfect. Um, it didn't address the issue as to whether elderly and frail patients um, could be helped by receiving chemotherapy before um, surgery. Um, and it also didn't look at whether giving patients, healthier and fitter patients, more chemotherapy might be beneficial. So Yorkshire Cancer Research are now fund funding Foxtrot 2 and Foxtrot 3. In Leeds, being led by a very talented uh, researcher and uh, doctor in Leeds, Dr. Jenny Seligman, um, with the assistance of Professor Dion Morton in Birmingham, and Dion Morton led Foxtrot 1. So, this is a fantastic team we've got working here. Um, Foxtrot 2 is looking at whether elderly and frail patients might benefit from chemotherapy before bowel surgery as well as after. And Foxtrot 3 is looking at whether fitter patients can actually benefit from receiving not just two types of chemotherapy before treatment but actually three times. So this is really exciting work, um, as I say, funded by Yorkshire Cancer Research in Leeds. So how does chemotherapy actually work? Okay, well, we've got a very, very simplified diagram of a cell here. So what we've got are two chromosomes surrounded by the surface of the nucleus. So chromosomes live inside a protected area, which is the nucleus. Now, this is, as I say, incredibly simplified. We've actually got 46 chromosomes inside a cell, but we're just, for the sake of simplicity, you're just going to show two chromosomes here. And also, this isn't to scale. The nucleus is nowhere near this big. It would be much smaller in reality. But again, to make it easy to see what's going on, we have an enlarged nucleus there. 
So this is our mother cell, which is about to divide. The first thing that it has to do is to create a perfect copy of each of the chromosomes. So the blue chromosome has copied itself and the green chromosome has copied itself. Because if this cell is going to split into two, each of those two new cells needs to have a full set of chromosomes. So this one set in the mother cell has to be copied. And this copying process is done phenomenally accurately. It's absolutely miraculous how accurate this copying process is because it's very complicated, but it is done phenomenally well. So here is the, um, the structure of a chromosome, which you're probably very familiar with, this beautiful double helix structure. Um, and a chromosome is very, very long, and it's made up of um, what the researchers call base pairs, but what you can think of as kind of rungs of a ladder. And an average, uh, an average chromosome would have about 3 billion base pairs or 3 billion rungs of a ladder. So to put this on the human scale, if you were standing looking at uh, a spiral staircase, that spiral staircase would just disappear off into the sky. You wouldn't be able to see the top of it. And to get to the top, you'd have to walk up 3 billion steps. Quite the task. So each rung, each base pair is two chemicals, C, A, T, and G. There's just four chemicals which get repeated over and over again, up the chromosome in various different patterns. So in order to make a copy of just one of the 46 chromosomes, three billion base pairs have to be perfectly copied. And there's two bits of information in each base pair because there's two chemicals. So that's six billion bits of copying that have to be done very accurately um, just to copy one individual chromosome. Now, to give you an idea of how accurate this chromosome copying is, let me introduce you to this chap, Philip Patterson. In 2009, he was recovering from a serious injury. He was off work and he was bored. Uh, and one night he was having a chat with his partner. His partner was a Muslim and his partner got talking about the Muslim tradition of copying out the Quran. And Philip Patterson apparently said, oh, well, it's all very well to the Quran. It's much shorter than the Bible. It wouldn't be possible for anybody to copy out the Bible. And his partner just looked at him and said, well, you've been telling me that you're bored and you've got plenty of time on your hands. Why don't you give it a go? And see if it's possible. So the very next day, Philip Patterson went to the stationers, bought himself a couple of these large notepads and a supply of pencils and a sharpener and sat down and started to copy out the King James Bible. And he very soon found that he was enjoying it. It was, it was giving him uh, kind of peace and serenity um, and he was enjoying the process. So he kept going and he kept going and he kept going. And eventually he managed to do a complete copy of the Bible. So he worked for an average of seven hours a day and it took him a total of four years. And he copied out 2,400 of these large pieces of paper by the time he'd finished. Now then, Let's say that instead of just copying out one King James Bible, I set Philip the challenge of copying out 40 Bibles. He'd be a very brave man if he took on that challenge because it would take him approximately 160 years and he would cover 96,000 of these large pages. Now let's imagine that he did this, 96,000 pages of writing, and in all those large pages of writing, he only made one single spelling mistake, he would be working at the same level of accuracy that our cells work at when they copy chromosomes. It's phenomenally accurate. Okay, so going back to the process, we get this, these accurately copied uh, versions of the chromosomes. Next step is that the surface of the nucleus dissolves and the chromosomes are now just uh, exposed within the cell. Next step is for the cell to start to elongate and turn into a bit of a figure of eight, so it gets pinched around the waist. And these structures appear, one at each end. These are called the spindles, it's an octopusy-like uh, structure. And they stretch out these long arms, and each spindle will grab one copy of each pair of the chromosomes. So one copy of the blue chromosome is going to get pulled this way, and one copy of the blue chromosome is going to get pulled this way. And imagine we've got 46 chromosomes arranged across there instead of two. It's quite a chaotic scene, but the spindles do a great job. And they attach to one copy each and they pull them apart. So the next step is we get the chromosomes beginning to be pulled towards the spindles. We get even more pinching across the waist. The cell is about to divide. 
If it's not a cancer cell, if it's a normal healthy cell, it runs some checks at this point to say, is this perfect? Have the chromosomes been copied perfectly? And if they have, the cell will get permission to divide into two daughter cells, each cell containing 46 chromosomes. Final thing that happens then is that the surface of the nucleus is formed again to protect these chromosomes. And these cells will grow physically in size, they will get bigger and they'll mature. And within 24 to 48 hours, they will be ready to divide again. So that's the process of cell division. So how does chemotherapy actually work? Well, chemotherapy has two main types, then they will attack this process at one of two stages. So some chemotherapy drugs will attack the process here, where the cells, where the chromosomes are, um, are being copied, or some other types of chemotherapy will attack the process here, where the spindles are beginning to pull the chromosomes apart. But the result is the same. They, basically, the chemotherapy drugs cause so much damage that the cell dies. So the chemotherapy drug kills this dividing cancer cell in one way or another. Okay, so that's how it works. However, chemotherapy drugs are not clever enough to know what is a cancer cell and what is a normal healthy cell, which just happens to be dividing at the time. And chemotherapy drugs will damage all dividing cells. So in a fully grown adult, some cells will rarely divide at all. So if you imagine your liver, as you're growing up from childhood to adulthood, your liver is getting bigger. But there comes a time when your liver doesn't need to get any bigger. And if it did, it would just continue to grow and become too big. So your liver cells get a message to say, stop dividing. And at that point, they will only divide again if there is damage to the liver, which needs to be repaired. But if there isn't, then those cells will stay dormant in terms of uh, uh, replicated themselves. They don't need to, so they don't. So some cells will rarely divide. However, there are other cells in the human body, normal healthy cells, which divide a lot. In fact, in the last second, while well, you've been listening to me, just in the last second, your body has made approximately 3.8 million new cells. Now, over 3 million of those new cells are just red blood cells, and they're very simple cells. They're basically just a sac that transports hemoglobin around the body. They don't have chromosomes and they're not complicated. So that's over 3 million of those 3.8 million are just red blood cells. However, that still leaves approaching 600,000 new cells every second, <coughs> pardon me, almost 600,000 cells every second, which do contain chromosomes. And each one of those approaching 600,000 new cells has been through this very complicated process of copying the chromosomes and dividing. Fast dividing cells, fast dividing normal non-cancer cells in the human body include white blood cells, which we've talked about a lot, stomach cells and bowel cells, and that's because um, stomach in particular is a very hostile environment, very acidic -y. so the cells on the surface of the stomach, they don't live for very long because it's not a pleasant place to live. So they're constantly being um, renewed as are the bowel cells further down. And hair cells are another type of cell which is fast dividing. So they are all affected um, when we give chemotherapy. And therefore, chemotherapy can cause impairment to the immune system. So the white blood cells are being killed off by the chemotherapy. And that is a really unfortunate irony of the situation because when a person is battling cancer, the very last thing that we would want to do would be to impair their immune system. We want them to have the strongest possible immune system in order to fight cancer. But we would have to give them chemotherapy treatments, which would impair that immune system. So as I say, a sad irony, very, very unfortunate. Situation is also the same with the stomach cells and the bowel cells. So they are being killed off by the chemotherapy. So we get impairment to the digestive system. And at the very time when we want that cancer patient to be able to get the best nutrition possible from everything that they eat and drink, we actually impair that nutrition system um, because the chemotherapy is killing off stomach cells and bowel cells. So again, another unfortunate irony. And then because hair cells are being affected by the chemotherapy, we also get baldness. Now, from a physical point of view, that's nowhere near as important as these two issues. But from a mental point of view, this can be the biggest problem for some people. Imagine a, a poor woman in her 30s, breast cancer maybe, um, feeling incredibly ill, and on top of that, having to deal with going bald um, 
in their thirties. So that mentally, this can be a huge issue for people to deal with. So these are very unfortunate effects of chemotherapy. And chemotherapy can be very tough on patients. And because of that, chemotherapy is often given in cycles. So people will get a period of treatment followed by a rest period in order to get over that treatment. So a cycle of chemotherapy can last anywhere between about one and four weeks generally. And a series of cycles of chemotherapy will be called a course of chemotherapy, and that will generally last somewhere between three and six months. Let me introduce you to this chap, David Nathan. So Dr. David Nathan was uh, at the very forefront of experiments with chemotherapy back in the 1950s. And he um, is in a film called The Enemy Within, which I absolutely recommend. Um, it's, a, it's about an hour long and it looks at kind of the history of all cancer treatments, surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, et cetera. And he's in it and he comes over as a very, very likable guy, very uh, warm character, clearly very caring about his patients. And there's one particular um, quote in that film which really struck me. In the 1950s, I used chemotherapy to treat around 50 children with leukemia. I made every one of them very ill, and I didn't save a single one. When I started, there was no hope for anybody. But that was back in the 50s. And the biggest problem they had right back at the beginning of trying to understand how to use chemotherapy was that they were just using one type of chemotherapy until the patient became resistant to it and then using another type until the patient became resistant to it, and then using another type until the patient became resistant to it. And that has turned out to be the wrong approach. What is actually much more effective is to give a cocktail of chemotherapies right at the beginning, but they didn't know that in the early 50s. So these children were being treated with one chemotherapy after another, and at the end of a very long and painful process, they were unfortunately dying. However, the reason I show you this quote is that it has a very optimistic ending because things have improved an awful lot since the 1950s. And this statement from David Nathan actually concludes with, now I weep if I lose a single child. There have been massive steps forward in all types of cancer treatments since the 1950s, but chemotherapy as well, we now have kinder treatments. As I say, we now have over hundred types of chemotherapy and we're much better at delivering that chemotherapy. So things have very much improved. Just to finish by going back to Isaac Berenblum, I'm just going to very quickly run through his career. So in the early 1930s, he did further mustard gas research and um, um, bladder cancer research in Leeds. Um, he, one of the things he went on to show was that even more dilute um, mixtures of, of mustard gas would cause um, the depletion of the white blood cells. In 1936, he moved from Leeds and became a research fellow at the University of Oxford. And not long after that, two years later, 1938, he became the head of the Oxford University Research Centre. And that was where he did his most famous work. So he pioneered carcinogenesis, um, research into carcinogenesis. And carcinogenesis is the process by which the very first normal healthy cell becomes a cancer cell. That process is called carcinogenesis. And as I say, Isaac Berenblum is most remembered for some very important work in the early days of research into that process. In 1948, he became a special fellow at the National Cancer Institute in Maryland in America. And didn't stay there long. 1950, came back across the Atlantic to Israel, where he became the head of the Department of Experimental Biology at the Weizmann Institute in Rehobot. And in 1974, he gets the biggest accolade of his career, he's awarded the Israel Prize for Biology. Now, as I said earlier on, and at the end of the late 70s, Isaac Berenblum wrote an essay about his life. It's not very long, and I would have liked a lot more information, in particular about his time in Leeds, but he does come over, as I say, as a very modest and likable guy, and I'm just going to pick this final quote from that essay. I do not feel that I have changed so much. I still experience some sense of adventure every morning when I set out to work, just as I did on that first day close to 50 years ago when I began my life as a scientist. Trying to discover the unknown is still exciting. So I'm very proud to be able to give this talk in memory of Professor Isaac Berenblum, born in 1903 in Russia and died in Israel in the year 2000. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it.